Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1220, Calculus 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Now, in this lecture 15, we're going, to get, we're going to continue our discussion of partial fraction decompositions and how we can use this to evaluate integrals of rational functions, uh, such as in section 7.4 of Stewart's textbook here. Now, in this lecture we're going to look at some more in well some more sidious examples of partial fraction decompositions um and what i mean by that is we're going to take what it seems like a very very tame antiderivative uh let's try to calculate the antiderivative of 3x minus 5 over x cubed minus 1 with respect to x now this one doesn't seem so bad at first like it is a proper fraction the the top which is linear is less than the cubic on the bottom the problem starts to come up when you factor this thing. x cubed minus 1, the denominator, if you factor this, it is a difference of cubes. You get x minus 1, and then the other factor is x squared plus x plus 1. Um, and if you try to factor this quadratic, you're going to find out that it has no real roots. So we often say this is an irreducible quadratic, which is somewhat of a misnomer. It's just by saying it's irreducible it means we cannot factor it more using real numbers. But if we're willing to use complex numbers, which are perfectly good numbers, uh, we actually could factor this into three linears, uh, three linear factors, for which then the antiderivative would be actually quite, quite a cinch. And I'll say some more about this at the end. Um, but for reasons that almost seem arbitrary to us, uh, we're actually going to require we only use real numbers in this situation. Again, that might seem to, to the viewer here, it's like, why would you want to use complex numbers? And it's kind of like, well, if you're Superman, wouldn't you want to use super speed, super sight, super flight, you know, to save the, the, the people who are crashing in the airplane, as opposed to regular people who have no superpowers? Of course, we would pick a superpower if we could, um, which the complex numbers offer us those superpowers. But we're going to arbitrarily tie some kryptonite to us and not allow us to proceed. Now, because we have this irreducible quadratic here, this x squared plus x plus 1, this is going to affect our template. 3x minus 5 over x cubed minus 1. We're going to get a template, we're going to get a factor, a partial fraction for each factor. So we're going to get an a over x minus 1. And then the second one is going to be x squared plus x plus 1 in the denominator. But as this is a proper fraction, the numerator potentially could be a linear polynomial bx plus c. And unlike uh, other situations, there's not a cool little trick we're going to do to simplify this thing. We kind of have to be stuck with what we have here. Uh, if we clear the denominators uh, times both sides by x cubed minus 1, we get 3x minus 5 on the left. We're going to get a times x squared plus x plus 1, because uh, that's the factor the first fraction didn't have. And then the next one, we're going to get bx plus c times x minus 1, like so. And so are there cool values we can choose to try to annihilate some things right here? Well, notice that we could take x equals 1. That's pretty simple. Um, and if we do that, we're going to get 3 minus 5 on the left, which is a negative 2. On the right, we get a times 1 plus 1 plus 1. And then that one got annihilated. That's why we chose 1. And so we see that the left-hand side equals 3a. And so a is going to equal negative 2 thirds. As our, uh, as our value right there, okay? In terms of annihilating by cool values, that's almost it. That's the only root that we could use because x minus 1, we did its root. The other two roots, that is the roots of x squared plus x plus 1, are non-real complex numbers. If we're willing to use complex numbers, we could annihilate here and we'd be done really quickly. Um, but, you know, without, without specifying what they are, we, we're going to have to stick with real numbers here. Now, we could switch and use the number x equals 0. That has a little bit of convenience uh, because of the following. If you plug in 0 on the right-hand side, you get a negative 5 on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we know that a is negative 2 thirds, so we'll stick with that. Plug it in 0 gives you 0, 0, and 1. Um, the advantage here is that 0 will annihilate b and leave c behind. So we get c times negative 1. Uh, simplifying this at all, we get negative 5 plus two-thirds is equal to negative c. Um, of course, five, well, 5 can become 15 over 3, like so. So you get negative 13-thirds, so c will become a positive 13-thirds, like so. 
all right? Um, it's doable. And now that we know B and C, or now that we know A and C, we can plug those in and find B if we just plug in a different number. Um, I'm gonna plug in say negative one, just because it's hopefully we'll have simple arithmetic. A negative one on the other side gives us a negative eight. So we get negative two thirds. If you plug in negative one, you're gonna get one. Minus one gets cancels, which also gives you a one right there. Um, this time for B, you're gonna get negative B plus C, which is a 13 thirds. And then you're gonna get a negative two. Again, as an example, um, if you don't like all the fractions floating around here, we could multiply the right side and the left side by three. That gives us negative 24 on the left. Uh, this will give us negative two plus negative three B plus 13 times that by negative two. Like, so everything's even now I notice. Uh, so divide everything by, we'll just do negative two. Uh, that gives us 12 is equal to one minus three B plus 13. Uh, one and 13 together, of course, give us a 14. Subtract so that from both sides of the equation. We end up with negative two is equal to negative three B and therefore B equals two thirds like so. So we can find, we can find uh, this by annihilation. It gets really cumbersome here. Not so simple as other situations. So plugging those in for A, B and C, uh, a, remember, was a negative two-thirds. We see that right here. Uh, so we're going to write that as negative two over three X minus one. Uh, for the next one, B turned out to be, uh, what was it? It was a positive two-thirds. C turned out to be 13 thirds. So there's a three in the bottom of both of them. So we're gonna plug those in. Uh, so we have a two B, so X is, that is B is two. So we get two X plus 13 over three times X squared plus X plus one. So we were able to do it. Again, the annihilation technique didn't work out super amazingly because of the awkwardness of trying to avoid, because we, we only had one root. And we were able to kind of get away with x equals zero to help us out here. But that was, this is sort of like an ad hoc argument. Um, it, it worked out, but kind of complicated. Um, on this situation, I think the systems of equations works out really nicely. Because remember, our equation looks like 3x minus 5 is equal to a times x squared plus x plus 1 plus bx plus c times x minus 1. If you FOIL out this thing right here, you end up with bx squared minus bx plus cx minus c. And so combining like terms, you're gonna have a term associated to x squared. The left side would be a zero. The right side, you'll get an a plus a b. You have a coefficient associated to x. The left-hand side gives us a three. The right-hand side gives us an a it gives us a negative B and plus C. And then lastly, for the constant, you get a negative five on the right. It's so on the left, excuse me, on the right, you get A uh, minus C. Um, it's a system of equations. Again, it's not, the, it's not the tamest of all, but really it's not gonna be much worse than we were before. Uh, we could solve this by substitution or elimination or anything like that. Um, let's see, I will just, I'm gonna take I'm going to take the first equation right here. That is, we're going to take the first equation and we're going to subtract from it the third equation. Um, if we do that, we end up with, in that situation, the A's are going to cancel. You get B minus C is equal to five. Uh, we get that. And then I, I guess I, I, I take that back. I want, I want to solve this one by substitution. Uh, let's take the first equation Let's take the first equation, solve it for a. That's the same thing as saying a is equal to negative b. Um, this is gonna be a little bit cleaner here. And then you could substitute that in for the a's and the other equations, like so. So in the second equation, um, you're gonna get a negative b minus a b, so that's a negative two b plus c equals three. And then the last one, you're gonna get a negative b 
minus C is equal to negative five. And so in this situation, we can then eliminate C very nicely if you add the two equations together. You get negative three B is equal to negative two, therefore B equals two thirds. That's similar to what we saw above, right? You should still see it right here. B was two thirds. Uh, and then once you have that, you can start plugging that into the other equations. So plug it in right here. We get negative two thirds minus C equals negative five. That is to say C equals negative two thirds plus five, which that will give us 13 thirds like we saw before. And then you can plug that into say the, the first equation. Remember, so the first equation, A plus B equals zero. If B equals two thirds, that means A equals negative two thirds. So in this one, I think the system of equations is a little bit cleaner. And I think in the long run, the linear systems will probably help you out here, but you can try the annihilation technique as well. Now, this is sort of like the first half of the problem, right? We found that we found the partial fraction decomposition. Uh, we're trying to integrate, remember what the original problem was, 3x minus 5 over x cubed minus 1 dx. And we've now seen by this algebraic calculation that this is the same thing. Uh, where did it go? This will be the same thing as negative 2 thirds over 3x minus 1 dx. And then the second one, you end up with 2x plus 13 over 3x squared plus x plus 1 dx. And so this first fraction isn't so bad. The negative 2 over 3, I mean, we can factor out the coefficients. Factor out the coefficients, you get negative 2 thirds, the integral of dx over x minus 1. The other one pull out of 1 third. So you get this 2x plus 13 over x squared plus x plus 1 dx. The first one, we've seen this one a couple times now. It's antiderivative will be negative 2 thirds, the natural log of x minus 1. Uh, but what about the second one, right? This one's much more complicated, much, much more complicated, right? Uh, so what do we do to address this concern right here? How do you deal with that x squared plus x plus one on the bottom? And there's a couple schools of thought that one could use here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make one that's commonly taught in calculus textbooks here. The idea is if we if we were to proceed with a u substitution, you would have to be x squared plus x plus one right here. In which case du equals 2x plus 1 dx. All right. In which case it's like, hmm. I have a 2x, but I don't have a 1, I have a 13. But 13 could be dissected into 1 and 12. In which case, if you did that, you could break this up to be 1 third the integral of 2x plus 1 over x squared plus x plus 1 dx. And then you have this 1 third 12 over x squared plus x plus 1 dx. And now, and now if, and if you're going to do this, if you're going to break up the 1 and the 12, you have to make sure that the, 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 thir the 1 third distributes onto both of them. Um, now for, for this one, 3 goes into 12 four times. So I'm just going to factor that out. So we get a 4 that's sitting in front and 1. And so now with this second, this second integral we see right here, we know what to do with it. It's set up perfectly for a u substitution. So it looks like du over u. And so it's antiderivative, much like the first one, is going to involve a natural log. We're going to get one third the natural log of x squared plus x plus one. Now on the second one, we actually don't need the absolute value because uh, x squared plus x plus one for all real numbers is going to be a uh, positive number. So the absolute value is redundant in that situation. But then it comes to the issue is what the junk are we going to do with this dx over x squared plus x plus one. We can kind of kick the can down the road so far. At some point, we have to kind of deal with it. Now, this actually reminds me of something we've seen when we did trigonometric substitutions. We have a quadratic polynomial in the denominator, x squared plus x plus one. Um, how, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Well, if it was like a sub square, that would actually be easy to deal with. We could do a tangent substitution. And it turns out that completing the square is what we have to do here. This x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to, if we try to complete the square, we take the x's and separate it from the constant, plus 1 there. 
we identify our guest of honor. We take half of the middle coefficient, which is itself one half, and then square it. So we have to add one fourth, in which case we then subtract one fourth. Then the x squared plus x plus one fourth, it would factor as x plus a half quantity squared. And then you add to that three fourths, like so. This is now the square completed. And this is supposed to help us get started for some type of u substitution. Uh, not u substitution, trigonometric substitution. Because we have a sum of squares, we would take x plus one half. This is going to be a tangent substitution because we have a sum of squares. And this will, x plus one half would equal the square root of three over two times tangent theta. That's a lovely substitution. Doable, yes, but a little complicated, right? Um, and look at some variations of this. If we solve for x, x would equal root three over two tangent theta minus one half. If we calculate dx, right, dx would equal root three over two secant squared theta d theta. And we should also make mention of the square root of x squared plus x plus one. This will equal root three over two secant theta. And you can derive that from the usual trigonometric equations or the usual, uh, the triangle diagrams and things like that. But that's what we're gonna need that for our substitution at some point. And so if you take all of this, right? Just looking at this portion of it for a moment. Let's do this substitution going forward. Uh, this would then look like we have a dx on top, which becomes root three over two secant squared theta d theta. On the bottom, we had a we had just x squared plus x plus one. That, so that's squaring this guy right here. Uh, that gives us a three over four secant theta d theta. Uh, not d theta. Sorry, just uh, just just a secant squared this time. And so that should cancel some things kind of nicely. Uh, the secant squareds cancel. Um, we have some cancellation. Two goes into four. We get a two right there. Uh, three square root of three goes into square root of three like so. And so when we simplify this, we end up with just the integral of two over the square root of three d theta, which antiderivative will be two over root three theta plus a constant. Now we have to solve for theta, uh, which using the equations we had above, solving for theta, well, let's, let's work that one out there. You're gonna get x plus, we're gonna get x plus two x plus one over two. You're gonna times that by two over the square root of three, the twos will cancel. That equals tangent, so take arc tangent. We end up with two over root three times two x plus one over the square root of three. I, I'm sorry, this should all be inside arctangent. So we have two over root three arctangent, two x plus one over the square root of three plus a constant. So that's part of the antiderivative. We didn't have to throw in the other things we had. And so in the end, we get something that looks like the following. Uh, we're gonna get, so the final answer, one third times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus x plus one. Whoops, I went out of order there. Oh well. Uh, minus two thirds the natural log of the absolute value of x minus one. Now remember, this antiderivative we found right here, we have to times it by four. There was a coefficient sitting in front of the integral. So we're gonna get uh, two times four, which is eight over the square root of three times the arc tangent of two x plus one over the square root of three plus a constant, like so. And so, whew, that one was quite insidious, like I said. Not having, or having that irreducible quadratic requires us to have to do some type of trigonometric substitution, complicates what was already a very, very difficult exercise right here. Now, I wanna say in comparison, original problem, right? The original problem we had was the integral of three x minus five, over x cubed minus one dx. Recognizing that the denominator factors in the following way, 
right? You're going to get a over x minus 1. We know that. Then there's the x squared plus x plus 1 with two different quadratic roots. Let's call the first one um, omega. And the second one, the, the root actually would be the complex conjugate, omega bar. What if we allow those complex numbers as the following, right? You get a partial fraction to, uh, decomposition looks like the following. Um, a over x minus 1, b over x minus omega, and c over x minus omega bar. Uh, to find the antiderivative here, you're going to get a times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1. You're going to get b times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus omega plus c times the natural log of x minus omega bar plus an arbitrary constant. Uh, you see twice there. Whoops. Anyways, you get something like the following. This might not look like the proper answer, but it turns out using logarithmic properties, when you combine this together, you're going to get the natural log of x squared plus x plus 1 plus an arctangent type of stuff. Uh, but the issue is, why did we do this? Well, if we didn't, if we chose, we chose not to use these complex numbers because we didn't want to deal with the arithmetic that would ensue, which in terms out the arithmetic is really not that painful. If we do a little bit of arithmetic with complex numbers, we could have avoided a ton of arithmetic we saw above here. The other issue is that we have to accept that the natural log could have a complex coefficient, the complex entries, I should say. Um, it has one extend the natural log uh, from the real numbers to the complex numbers. And there is an issue that has to be discussed there, but if one's willing to do that, it turns out that complex numbers can make this very hard problem become a very trivial problem. But it takes a little bit of uh, development of doing complex variables. And in fact, we have a course at Southern Utah University, many universities have a very similar course to this, uh, about complex variables. How does one do calculus problems with complex values? And it turns out that it might not seem obvious because complex numbers aren't real, right? That's why we call them real numbers. Those are all misnomers. But if we're willing to use some complex numbers, we can dramatically simplify these calculations. Unfortunately for Calculus 2 students, we don't get to go down the easier path because we have to be trapped in this much more difficult path of having our real number blinders on. And so I wanted to present this to you because some of you in the future will learn some more about complex numbers or some of you might actually be interested in learning more about complex numbers because they do help us solve real life problems. It might seem counterintuitive, but imaginary numbers can help us solve real problems in a much easier way than real numbers alone can do.